the end of the webinar. I get a couple of uh, contacts from scrum.org asking if the webinar was going to be recorded and it's going to be. So I hope even if some people couldn't make it, they can uh, replay this uh, webinar afterwards. Yes, absolutely. All right, thank you everybody for giving us a moment there to get all set up. Welcome to today's Scrum Pulse and um, as Alex already mentioned, we are going to be talking about, well, Alex is going to be talking about how we make Scrum and OKRs work together. This is a burning topic and it's been a lot of interest and discussion around this topic. So I am super excited. So let's dive in. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Lindsay Velasina with Scrum.org. I'm going to be moderating today and we have with us Alex Bayarin, one of our professional Scrum trainers to walk us through the content. So very quickly, I just wanna share some guidelines. You'll notice that your camera is off and your microphone is muted. However, we do encourage questions. So please utilize the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And that is where we're going to be collecting your questions. If you have any technical questions, please reach out in the chat. Or if you just have some simple comments, you can utilize the chat for that as well. I am going to turn on different permissions for that in a moment. Um, and as Alex mentioned earlier, the session is being recorded. So if you can't stay the whole time, that's okay. You will get the recording in your inbox within 24 hours. And you will also get a copy of the slides. So with that, uh, next slide, please, Alex. Okay, very quickly about scrum.org. We are the home of Scrum, and we were founded by Ken Schwaber back in 2009. And we, our mission is to help people and teams solve complex problems. And we do so through our professional Scrum training, certification, and our ongoing learning opportunities. There are a lot of free learning opportunities on the Scrum.org website, so please check those out. Um, there's a plethora of resources, and I hope today's session plays an important role in that learning journey as well. So with that, I will hand it over to Alex to kick off the content. Okay, so thank you a lot, Scrum.org and Lindsay, for having me here. I've been uh, working with Scrum.org since uh, 2016, and I started some years before working with Scrum. Uh, and uh, I experienced uh, how other techniques or models like user experience or OKRs were helpful in, in achieving the uh, goal of a Scrum or of creating highly valuable products. So I started to investigate and, and, and work with them and I would like to share some of my learnings. So, uh, okay, so this is the uh, slides. Here are my contacts in case you want to ask anything or follow me, whatever, it will be, I will be glad. So, uh, well, uh, I would like to illustrate this uh, topic with a case study I use in most of my courses, which is called, apparently funny name, Gym Tonic. It is a gym that uh, faces some uh, problems because it has been growing uh, a little bit uh, away from the trends and uh, not adopting the technology or not uh, improving in uh, offering new services. The equipment is a little bit updated and uh, customers are cho choosing other teams and uh, even the uh, employees are, you know, just uh, thinking that they would like to work in a more innovative place. Uh, let's see the opinions of the managers. So the managers indeed have realized that they are losing track against the competition, uh, and but uh, they have a quite traditional mindset. So they try to do new things, but at the same time they want to stay uh, f uh, following their the way of doing business. And uh, when they have a, when they assign budget and they assign initiatives, 
they struggle to get them done and to get uh, things changing. Uh, at the same time, they have their internal IT team, but the IT team is flooded by work of the business as usual requests. Uh, they don't ha have a clue of the corporate strategy. Uh, they would like to propose new things like, you know, uh, using a uh, mobile application or connecting, uh, getting these new fitness machines that are digital and connecting those to the uh, mobile application or whatever. But again, uh, they feel like a fit in factory and some of them, they are even thinking of leaving. Those. They cannot uh, add, their, they are not very aligned with the strategy or motivated. So what we are going to see is how Scrum and OKRs can help Team Tonic to solve their challenges. And at the same time, Scrum and OKRs have challenges themselves. Uh, I don't know if you're coming from the Scrum side or the OKR side or any, but uh, I've experienced many Scrum teams having challenges. Like for example, they cannot generate the maximum value because they are just delivering features and they cannot decide many of the times if those features or those requests are have the priority enough to be delivered, or they are not measuring the value they are generating, or they are not aware, or they do not have the context of the corporate strategy, or they don't even have a product strategy. Another kind of uh, challenges is that uh, for them, they have dependencies with other teams and they cannot self-manage in order to solve them. And uh, the PBI is that the items in the backlog are just feeders, feeder, not problems, not research, just deliver software, okay? Because we want to deliver things fast. And we assume that our internal ideas are great, so no need to do research before delivering them. Uh, if you come from the OKR side, even if OKRs has grown in popularity in the last years, uh, OKRs have uh, and pro can provide very great benefits, OKRs have also issues. For example, some teams have uh, issues uh, executing on cycles because uh, sometimes from uh, check-in to check-in, this method is not prescribing any kind of a structure or roles. Um, the retrospectives are only happening at the end of the quarter. So there is no, it's not easy for them to identify and solve uh, operating issues. Um, even if uh, OKRs prescribes this uh, vertical al alignment and horizontal, al horizontal alignment, tips, it is not always easy to really enact it. And at the same time, Agile is everywhere and OKRs has not always found the uh, way of uh, really optimizing the integration with Agile teams. So because the Agile teams are at the same time, many times uh, having this uh, output-oriented culture and uh, what uh, OKRs prescribes is this outcome-oriented culture and sometimes they are adults. Uh, so, oops, what's happening here? Let me find out because apparently I will be showing here, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, okay, and another thing I would like to show is the outcomes over outputs. Uh, both models suffer when the organization is asking to deliver outputs, which is software things, instead of achieving outcomes, which is uh, improvements for the uh, customers or initiative improvements for the business. So what you're seeing here at the screen is what it's called the project logic model, which identifies stages in the creation of value that happens in the organizations. Basically, uh, what we can consider is at which level are we putting our uh, goals or our metrics. Typically, what we can set as a goal is something related to output. We want to deliver whatever, a piece of software, it can be an outcome. We can we want to improve the life of our customers to provide them a benefit. Or it can be a return on investment, what it's called an impact. Okay, we want to win more money, we want to win more customers, whatever. Okay, what happens is that 
uh, in a traditional uh, minded organizations, what they even if they are using agile for delivering uh, software, they keep some core processes such as the, the yearly budget. And uh, what they do is to define their strategy, their strategic initiative shaped as projects. And those initiatives are handed over to the teams. Okay, And as you know, uh, the projects are characterized by this iron triangle of scope, time, and budget. And uh, what teams are um, tracking while running, their initiatives are precisely those things. And they are, um, Agile is pretty good in delivering things on time and on budget, but uh, are we sure that uh, that software is going to be used? Because many organizations are just not tracking the usage of the software. And uh, beyond that, uh, are, are customers getting the benefit we expected from the software? And is that contributing to a return on investment or more sales or, or more loyal customers or whatever? And uh, if we only if we miss this uh, missing focus area, which is the outcomes, uh, it's very difficult that uh, we can learn from our incremental releases, and uh, it's difficult that uh, we are creating a strategy based on people and a more initiative, innovative strategy. So what we are going to come back to this model later, but just keep in mind that it's important to have these outcomes over outputs mindset to make both Scrum and both OKRs succeed. So uh, let's uh, dive in a little bit on Scrum. OK, so uh, sorry, because I have something wrong with this, the order. Sorry about that. OK, but uh, Scrum is goal-oriented and has been like this for a long time. Okay? We have always had the spring goal to be the overarching direction for the sprint. But unfortunately, many times, what we had is a scattered sprint backlog of different functionalities. And sometimes the sprint goal is like an umbrella put after the sprint backlog has been formulated and not the other way around. Okay, And one of the big uh, improvements on the uh, 2020 version of the Scrum Guide is introduction of this product goal. OK, so the product goal is a longer uh, goal, longer, a bigger goal than the spring goal, and it's supposed to have a bigger impact on the business. And uh, as the Scrum Guide 2020 says, the contents of the backlog basically should be work packages aimed to achieve this product goal. So it reinforces this connection with the strategy. And uh, let me check because. Uh, okay, this is working now. And uh, another thing I would like to mention is that the sprint, as defined on the guide, uh, is isolated. I mean, you don't have this uh, kind of a structure over superstructure on top of it. So, uh, in order to be effective, many times sprints need to have this broader context, means that uh, having a clear product vision of what's the important thing about your product and what is not. Having this strategy, what are the key problems, the key solutions, the way we are going to deliver value? How are we going to measure value and other things? Okay, What kind of customers are we going to face and so on, knowing them well, is providing this kind of uh, context to the team so they can be more autonomous and take better decisions if they are aware of this uh, context. And then another thing that is not appearing on the Scrum Guide is the roadmap. And better if the roadmap is an outcome-oriented roadmap. Okay, so we, how, what outcomes are we want, do we want to deliver? And just uh, also the, as happens with the release planning. Okay, so we don't have this kind of high-level plan in order to deliver a bigger goal. Okay, And uh, more things that are not... Uh, present on the guide because the guide purposely is minimalistic, wants to stay to the bare minimum in order to uh, have empiricism, is how what kind of metrics are going to help us to steer our initiative. In this case, key results can be those kind of metrics in order to deliver value. So uh, these kind of things, if we have those things, the vision, the strategy, a goal-oriented roadmap, 
uh, are going to provide, uh, and also TRs, are going to provide more context in order to take better decisions. So yeah, that's those things we should be aware. Okay, so moving on, evidence-based management. I don't know if you are aware of this model. Evidence-based management uh, is different from Scrum, and I encourage you to, to go to scrum.org and download the guide. It's very short, about 10 pages. Okay, but evidence-based management is quite well known for having these four key BAs, key value areas, these metrics, but not so well known for having these three levels of goals. Okay, so we have this strategic goal, which is a very ambitious goals, goal, sorry, which is intended to have a big impact on the business or in the customers and is difficult to achieve and certain. This intermediate goal, which as you see here, is uh, a way to an intermediate uh, step, a step stone in order to go to this, uh, to this uh, strategic goal. And the thing about intermediate goals is that they are small enough to be able to uh, have a plan in order to uh, start progressing, even if you don't know if the plan is going to be very detailed, but you have something to start with. And the immediate tactical goal, which is uh, this smaller fillet uh, circle, that and in so even if the Scrum, the sorry, the ABM guide is not suggesting this, there is a clear and at least in my experience correspondence between the intermediate goal and the product goal, and the uh, intermediate tactical goal, sorry, the media tactical goal, and the spring goal. Okay, so I think it helps a little bit to have a pattern. So in this case, even if we are going to see later the uh, what's the OKRs, just imagine that the big impact we want to create is that we want to have the most satisfied customers in town by the end of the year. So this is one of the characteristics of OKRs. This is an ambitious, qualitative, and time uh, constraint objective. And how are we going to measure if we are progressing through to this uh, objective? Then we have several, a small number, one, two, or even three key results where we quantify how success looks like. For example, uh, in order to have those, the most satisfied customers in town, we want our NPS, our net promoter score, to grow to, from 10% to 50%. And at the same time, another dimension of measuring success is having a customer attrition reduced from 30% to 10%. Okay, so this is the way we can shape this. And we can say, for example, it's going to take us a whole year to achieve this, we hope. And then we're going to start breaking down this very big goal into smaller goals that are somehow actionable. For example, an intermediate goal that we could meet, hopefully in a single quarter, could be uh, using techniques as impact mapping. We can identify several potential uh, intermediate goals. Like for example, 70% of the users are able to self-book activities using a mobile application. Or we could have another such 30% of the users can link their mobile application with fitness machines. Or even uh, some uh, users can go together, can find friends in order to go together to the activities. Okay, so uh, however we do this, we are breaking down this big and very unknown uh, or difficult goal into smaller goals. And then we have something we can start planning against. Okay, and in this case, it could take us several sprints eventually to reach this intermediate goal. And in this case, for example, we are progressing sometimes better, sometimes even not progressing that much. But uh, after some sprints, just imagine that uh, the current spring goal, we have just finished it and it was enabled uh, the application users to book tennis courts, okay? And uh, the quarterly TR, which somehow is a way of tracking if we are getting closer to the intermediate goal, is we are at 55% of the activities are now booked online through this application. So we are getting pretty close to this uh, goal. Okay, We are not still there, but we are getting closer. And at the same time, we can also measure if we are making our progress towards this long -term, longer term goal. And it looks like in some dimensions, like for example, net promoter score, we are improving. In others, like the attrition, we are flat. 
they are just not improving. But at least we have some uh, indicators that somehow help us to gauge if we are progressing or not in our strategic plan. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so now let's talk about OKRs. What are OKRs? OKRs is a goal setting method invented at Intel in the 70s and uh, which, which grew popular when Google started to use it in the early 2000s. And now it has become even more popular. OKRs is very simple indeed. It's an evolution of the traditional management by objectives uh, method invented by Peter Drucker. But in this case, the objective, as we saw before, is a qualitative, ambitious, uh, and time-constrained goal. And we measure our execution on that objective throughout, through several what it's called key results, where uh, they are, uh, well, we, we can quantify them and, and we can, uh, from having them, have a clearer uh, clue on how to execute them. Okay, so uh, OKRs, without going into the detail, that have some guiding principles. For example, yeah, the goal should be, the objective should be clear and time constrained. Uh, it should help teams to align with the uh, strategy and with the management and the, at the same time to, to be autonomous in how to achieve those goals. Um, the uh, objectives, they can we can have several levels. Okay, so we can have the company level, the team level, whatever, but we're expected to have a few objectives, one, two, or even three. Okay, no, uh, the fewer, the better. And uh, regarding key results, we are going to measure each of the objectives. We are also intended to have very few uh, key results okay, in order to focus, which is one of the key principles. Uh, another thing is that we typically have a yearly company cycle, OKRs, and we break those cycles into shorter, quarterly, uh, smaller, and more actionable KRs. Some people prefer four months, some other shorter, bi-monthly. And another of the principles is focus on outcomes, not, not on outputs. Okay, And this is intended to foster transparency, accountability, collaboration, that kind of uh, benefits. Um, OKRs are a way of executing the strategy. Okay, so in order to have effective OKRs, we need to have a strategy. Else, our goals are not going to have this uh, strategic alignment or this. Uh, we don't. We, yeah, yeah. We may have uh, goals. We may have KRs, but from which criteria are we defining those? So we need first to have a strategy. Then OKRs are going to help us to effectively deploy our strategy. And then once we have defined our OKRs, KRs are going to be used in order to define the key activities in order to try to push or to achieve those uh, OKRs. And then uh, another thing I would like to mention is that uh, in the same manner that Scrum is uh, iteratively helping us to improve, so OKRs do I mean we define our strategy, we break it, uh, we would have a very big strategy, break it into smaller yearly goals, okay, and then break it again into a quarter quarterly goals, and that somehow is aligned with the product goal because we have several sprints in order to achieve something ambitious. Then we are executing, and uh, the advantage of having Scrum is that creates more structured way of executing. And we are measuring uh, and also learning. Okay, so it looks like it's uh, mapped a little bit with the Scrum. Uh, so I think we, I lost, sorry about that, I lost my uh, the outline. <laughs> it was great, it was working before. So let's see an example. Okay, in this case, uh, this counter mission is to provide high quality sports and wellness services that improve people's health and sense of community. Okay, so this is the long term mission. 
the strategy of uh, the new strategy of uh, gym tonic in order to improve their current situation is to focus on the most profitable and premium users who are looking for a personalized digital fitness experience. So in order to do this, what they have is these yearly OKRs. So they define this qualitative and time constraint uh, objective of have the most satisfied customers in the city by the end of the year. So this is fairly uh, uh, ambitious, okay? And they define some yearly TRs. Uh, so, uh, okay, so we can have several, but let's just identify the first one is increase customer NPS from 10% to 50%. And we can identify some longer term initiative like develop a customer application. And then we break down this objective into a smaller ones, more at the team level, typically. And what, what we would like to achieve by this quarter is that most users are able to self-book their activities. And we are going to measure if we are progressing or not, if, for example, um, tennis uh, courts are self-booked, and we would like to achieve this 50%. And we could do the same for other kind of fitness activities, okay? And here, once we have identified these key results, we can start identifying more. How are we going, what things can we deliver to, to create this outcome? In this case, we could identify epics or any sort of uh, work packages. And the thing is that when we are on the beginning of the uh, OKR cycle, we can have many potential things that are going to uh, help us to reach this gear. We can use, for example, a matrix uh, identified by the value and the risk or whatever in order to start prioritizing how are we going to deliver this. Okay, but this is a little bit outside the uh, scope of, of this, this moment. So, okay, so we have seen OKRs, we have seen Scrum, how to map those things at the same time. So we, saw, we said before that uh, typically, OKRs uh, have a longer yearly cycle and a quarterly cycle, smaller one for teams. Okay, so here, what I did is two, uh, whoops, I'm sorry because it looks, I break down this. Uh, we have several weeks, typically 12 to 14 weeks, and uh, we can have several sprints. Okay, so we, what we do is to uh, align both the uh, beginning of the OKR cycle events and the regular check-in events throughout the cycle, okay? And we are going to see, sorry, because something is... <laughs> okay, so let's see how uh, an OKR cycle begins and how is that aligning with Scrum. Uh, an OKR cycle begins with defining the OKRs, okay? So we have our yearly OKRs. Now we need to define our uh, OKRs, okay? You see here that we have the uh, organizational OKRs, the, that they could be just defined once a year. And then we define typically at quarter, uh, quarter level, our team OKRs okay, that are contributing somehow to this as we saw before. Then we have another event in this pink color, which is the alignment, because we want that uh, the team's uh, OKRs are really well aligned with the organizational longer term OKRs. And we also want that all the teams that are supposed to work together on an organizational OKR are aligned. Either they have the same OKR or they have different OKRs, but they identify how their work is going to align in order to deliver. So there is a explicit alignment event. Okay, so for the moment, we have defined our quarterly OKRs. Now, we, what we need to do is to do our release planning or any other name where we have a plan on how to deliver several sprints in order to reach this quarterly goal. Okay, so we define the work of several sprints. Uh, then uh, we have our regular sprints. So we have our sprint planning, we have our daily scrum, and then it comes the sprint review after, for example, a typical two-week sprint. And then the thing is that uh, for those of you which don't know very well 
uh, OKRs. And OKRs would have a similar event, which is called the check-in. So each one or two weeks, typically, we have we get together the members of the team, and then we discuss if we are on track, if the our activities has been successful or not, and we share the problems. So this is very well aligned with the spirit review. So we can do the, both events on the same one. So we are not expecting to have an OKR team and or an Scrum team doing the software. We we should have the we should be the, the same team doing both things. And uh, what we have in Scrum and we don't have in OKRs is a shorter spin retrospective. Uh, what we are going to see is that uh, the OKR cycle have a retrospective at the end. But uh, the good thing is that by using Scrum, we have many more chances of improve our way of working. And from one OKR, we improve, we change things in the same way that we do in a review, and we go to the next cycle. Okay, and what happens here is that uh, at the end of the uh, cycle, we have our last sprint, and we have what is called the OKR review, which is a longer event when we, we really uh, inspect uh, the real impact, the final impact we did with our product. And we have a final OKR retrospective. But as I said before, one of the advantage of adding OK, uh, Scrum on the top of OKRs is that we have many more chances of improve our way of working. So uh, let me check because wow, this is... Uh, <laughs> it really went mad. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I do apologize. Okay, because I wanted to, to avoid this. Okay, so um, let's do an example of how to how to how do we start our uh, OKR cycle. So we have our objective. We have those KRs we have identified before, and then we brainstorm how are we going to do work. We can use impact mapping. We can use story mapping. There is many techniques in order to know, in order to try to identify the work for the quarter. And then uh, the, the basic thing is that uh, what we do is, okay, uh, we may start growing incrementally our features. The thing is that we are not, uh, we don't want this quarter to be a mini waterfall. Okay, so we are, for example, in this case, we are still checking if this new feature to book uh, resources in the gym is going to be successful. So we stand, so we, sorry, uh, again, want to emphasize that uh, we should be doing discovery activities in order to make sure that uh, the things that the, the, the features we have defined are likely to do the job or not. Okay, and then once we progress, okay, so this is spring goals, those are the backlog items, and then we start measuring if, uh, for example, our MVP rendered good results, and it looks like or not that our customers are going to enjoy this uh, new feature, okay? And then, uh, hopefully, we can start implementing a first uh, version of our booking feature for tennis and start measuring if our customers are using or not and at the end of the sprint, learn why they did or they didn't. And then start implementing more and more things. But our overarching guide is the metrics, OK? Because we want the qualitative information brought by the Scrum team uh, helping to guide the next sprints. But it is very important that we all together, both the people in the team, both the stakeholders, uh, discuss about metrics. And we are going to see that here. OK, and uh, that's. What that is what I wanted to share. Okay, one of the big flaws of many sprint reviews is that they do basically a demo. Okay, they they do a demo of, of, of the product and, and that's all. And and this is a misuse, at least we're not using this event to its fullest potential, because uh, the sprint review is intended to really optimize the work we are going to do in the next sprints. So just by doing a demo. We are not optimizing this. We should use definition of done and more shorter term validation activities in order to bring all the work ready to be uh, just uh, considered as done and discuss about higher level things such as KPIs or strategy, whatever. So 
this uh, kind of agenda is uh, setting things up in order to have people discussing about the strategy, about the product goal, about the feed, the spring goal. And in this, in this uh, concrete point, we are having this arrow, we are defining, sorry, we are reviewing the key arcs. So in this case, what we are doing is, okay, uh, we want to use OKRs to prompt discussion, such as, okay, so we add a reminder to our functionality of tennis booking courts, because some people is not turning up when they have booked a court, and we want to uh, minimize this number of people. So did it work or not? And in the case, it didn't work, why not? Okay, so it is going, it, it has been proved as an effective feature. We can extend that feature to the activities booking. Okay, uh, are we on track to achieve the quarterly key results? Uh, are we? What are we learning on our assumptions? If the story map or impact mapping, whatever, what are we learning? So we are more talking using this event to have a more strategic conversation and uh, leaving this tactical or functional validation to uh, within the sprint. So. That is where both the sprint review and the OKR checking come together in order to uh, have a better version of both events. Because in, in the checking, sometimes we don't have a guidance on how to do things. In, re in the review, we have a broad experience on how to run good sprint reviews. Okay, and okay, we are um, going, we are, we are making our way. And uh, as a bonus, uh, I would like to discuss uh, another tool which, uh, on top of uh, evidence-based management, could help as a scaffold to make more effective uh, the you, to, using together Scrum and OKRs, which is flight levels, as you see here. Flight levels is a model where we have three levels of boards. The higher level, the fly level three is the strategy, is where uh, we have our strategy, we have our yearly and quarterly initiatives, you see as a Kanban board, and then we have our initiatives. Okay, so we are going to see that as an example. And the good thing is that higher management is checking this, for example, once each two weeks together with a representative from the team. So we don't have here a PMO trying to filter out the information. We are having the real people running the initiatives, could be the product owners or whoever, going each two weeks or something to spend 30 minutes with the top management just sharing the status of initiatives. So they have a very clear and direct uh, status of the things. Uh, the second level is uh, the coordination level where those initiatives, which could be small initiatives, epics, whatever, are just broken down on smaller pieces and assigned to teams. And what we are making sure is that things are not getting blocked. And the, again, the same people that is going to talk to the higher management is also coordinating the execution. No intermediaries here, no PMOs, the same initiative leaders. Okay. And those leaders are going, for example, a couple of days of times a week to uh, coordinate directly with other people which are involved in the execution. And it would be operations, it would be acquisitions, it could be other team, it could be whoever okay, is involved in this uh, execution. And then we have the level one, which is the typical team board we're using in Scrum. So this could help as a kind of elevator where the people doing the work is coordinating with other in level two, and it's going to report uh, to level three with the managers to have a direct push in case things are getting uh, stuck, okay? And then uh, again, like we saw before, in the strategic board, we have the vision and the strategy. So all the managers and the related stakeholders are aware of this. And we have the yearly objectives, in this case, for example, for this mobile application and the quarterly objectives. And we have a first 
uh, the composition of work to be done, for example, initiative for ethics. Then, as we are seeing here, the execution of those high-level goals is tracked on flight levels two, and the smaller work is uh, tracked on the team's board. But one of the key things and why uh, this level is very, these flight levels is very effective, is that it is the same people going up and down for strategic coordination and execution level that we impose this work in progress limit. So we don't have the we don't want the management flooding people with initiatives. We are only going to start doing new work as soon as the initiative has proven that they have uh, delivered the outcome that we were seeking. Okay, and, and this way we are going to have a stable volume of work uh, being done by the team. Okay, and uh, in this case, uh, what we are going to see is that in this case. We, we're having this, the, th the same thing we saw before, the yearly strategy, the quarterly strategy, and the, the composition on initiatives, for example, EPICS, okay? And uh, we can also track the OKRs here. So in the same place, we have the strategy, we have the goals, and we have the work at the highest level. And, the, and that's the thing that the team leaders or the initiative leaders need to discuss with the management, not not uh, something which is more detailed that the management is typically not going to be interested. And uh, here, okay, we are seeing in action uh, how an epic is decomposed in, in smaller stories, and those stories are flying to the development team, as we are seeing here. Okay, so this are flying here, are being done here, okay? And then in order to roll out, okay, they, they can be done by the same team or whoever, okay? They can go back and be done. But when they need to be roll out a new feature for the gym users, it is the operation teams which is going to do that. So we know very well this epic, who is working on that, do we have any, it is stuck everywhere, okay? And the people from development and the people from operations can discuss uh, who can do that in order to keep the work flowing. Okay, so this is, uh, yes, I, I just wanted to mention that these fly levels, with this I'm going to finish, okay? It helps to uh, even enhance the effectiveness of Scrum and OKRs that sometimes lies on the dependency management and so on. Okay, so I want I just wanted to add this as a bonus. So just to finish, and thank you a lot for your attention. Tools. Uh, this is always a hot topic. Uh, I my experience is start very simple, even with an online spreadsheet. But if you are using, for example, Atlassian, there are tools integrated with uh, this. Okay, but there is many tools around. And uh, books. Uh, this is a very good book I would recommend to you. The Measure What Matters by John Dor. Okay, a very good book. Uh, another which is super recent. I think it was released one or two weeks ago by my friend Jeff Gottel and Josh Shaden, which is Who Does, Does What by How Much, uh, which is very nice book because I just read it in just four days because it's really... I enjoy it a lot. And uh, it defines OKRs from the customer-centric perspective, which really, really uh, links very well with agile development and Lean UX and so on. Okay? There are many places where you can learn about OKRs, for example, OKR mentors and working with. And uh, as the last thing is that if you are interested by fly levels as another scaffolding tool for for, for managing dependencies and creating alignment. Uh, there is a very nice book by Klaus, Klaus Leopold, which is called Rethinking Agile, where you can learn about this model. And, uh, okay, so um, I think it's... Uh, 
Uh, I hope it's going to help work now. No? Okay. <laughs> uh, this is the demo effect. So now it's time to, uh, I will be so glad to, to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all of that, Alex. That was great. Very, very insightful. So much information. So this question here, um, how do intermediate goals differ from OKRs? Um, okay, let's go back to this. Sorry about the flickering. Um, yeah, the thing is that uh, they are separate things, but there are some patterns you can observe. Okay, so intermediate goals are things that you can start planning against. Okay, this is uh, quite similar to what the new concept of product goals are. Okay, so and also uh, OKRs, they have a pattern, even if it's not mandated, that we break down bigger goals or yearly goals into quarterly goals. Okay, so they have in common that they are actionable. We can start planning, even if we cannot plan typically the whole thing, but we can start planning. It is something which is feasible in an intermediate amount of time, which allows us to do some significant work, but at the same time, in case we are wrong, not losing that much time in order to learn and correct a course of action. So I think they share this kind of uh, intermediate level, which has enough time to create some impact, but is uh, short enough to uh, be able to correct without uh, much uh, issue with a big problem. I don't know if that helps. OK. Thank you. If you need more clarification, let us know. All right. So this question, I thought this was an interesting question. It has a little bit of context. So I am going to drop it into the chat so everyone can read it. I'm going to drop that here. So one good thing about OKRs is that they generate connections among different departments, not only software and product teams, they also allow marketing, sales, et cetera, to work on focused outcomes together. However, scrum teams are generally organized to deliver incre increments of software or product, and they're usually not made of people from marketing or sales. Well, in some cases they are, but I see what they're saying. So question, how could this connection between OKRs and Scrum also increase collaboration between different departments, all working toward hey. the same outcomes, even if they don't share um, daily meetings or backlogs. I really like that. Um, yeah, this is super good. Okay, let me just uh, go here. Okay, the thing is that from the Scrum point of view, we'd love to have really end-to-end -end teams which are able to incorporate people from, as you say, sales, marketing, whoever, and they are able to uh, work together to deliver a new product. Okay, but the, the thing developers sometimes uh, reminds us of software developers, but uh, as the Scrum Gates Guide says, uh, everyone which is working uh, effectively in a product should be in the team somehow. Uh, yeah, uh, the thing is that, uh, for example, in, I want to show this because even if we have, for example, step A could be sales, for example, helping to shape requirements, and a st a step B could be the developers, Okay, hopefully they could be together, but this this could help. Uh, and uh, going back to the uh, OKRs, the thing is that we have this alignment. Okay, we have this alignment uh, uh, event where everyone which is uh, somehow able to help should be... Uh, talking each other in order to know how are they going to collaborate. For example, let's imagine that we have our application for the gym, but we have the operations that are the people, the, the fitness specialists that are going to use the uh, APP in order to help them to connect this application to the digital machines. So if they are going to work in this feature, okay, being able to connect uh, this mobile application to these digital fitness machines. Okay, so they need to identify that both of them 
both the developers and also the fitness specialists are going to, they need to collaborate throughout the execution. So they need to, to somehow identify that they can contribute to the same goal, which is having people using this uh, new feature of synchronizing data from the digital fitness machines into the mobile application. Some of them are going to develop the feature. Some others are going to test it or even roll out and, and help the customers. So the key at this point is this one, the alignment. Okay, so teams define the OKRs in case, uh, for example, these software developers and these uh, fitness specialists, uh, they need to identify that they need to work together. And better if they have this kind of boards from the like the Nexus integration board or the flight levels level two that are mm, intended to create transparency on the work where several parties need to contribute. I don't know if that helps. Great, thank you. All right, um, we have time for, to squeeze in a couple more questions here. If we don't get to your question, I am going to be sharing the questions with Alex after the session and we'll figure out a way to get them answered. So rest assured, we, we do care about your questions. Um, we're just running up on time. So this, this question will probably be relatively quick. Um, someone had asked, um, look, looks like you need fast releasing of your software to make this work. How can you use OKRs if you release only twice a year? So maybe you want to dive in a little bit into um, incremental delivery a little bit and um, how this differs. Yeah, but can you please repeat or what is the question? Sure. The question Keep was, looks, looks like you need fast releasing of your software to make this work. How can you use OKRs if you release only twice a year? Uh, I do not uh, understand very well why uh, we have to decouple. I think this is, as if I understand well, this is a, a misunderstanding also with the Scrum. We have to decouple releases from measuring, okay? So in Scrum, we can uh, release uh, several times during the sprint and be able to measure during sprint review or mean to share the measures. Uh, in OKRs, we can release many times. Uh, what we are going to use uh, OKRs is to uh, take decision. And uh, even I think it reinforces the, the, the need to release because if we are going to check in each two weeks in OKRs and we are not having a kind of pilot or team which is uh, leading the testing or the use of the software, uh, we need to, to be able to release and to measure things that are happening in, in production on, on real life. So uh, OKRs typically are quarter, we have quarterly, but we need to progress with real data or real environment and real uh, users that uh, our, those real indicators are, are really uh, moving. So we need to release more often, okay? Even at the end of the sprint or even in shorter time frames, we could have um, pilots or you know small teams that are, or small groups, cohorts of people that are testing the software or being early adopters and getting some data from them. But we need to release anyway uh, the cadence or the cycles of, of uh, OKRs and also the cycles of the sprints from the measures. Okay, so the end of the cycle, both at the sprint uh, concept and also at the OKR cycle, are intended to take decisions. But we need to, to release typically before in order to have real data if we want to take decisions at the end of the sprint. For example, in sprint number one, we can release something and then we, we will need some days. So it is a little bit difficult sometimes at the sprint review to have enough data, if any, in order to really make sure that one feature has been successful. Okay, so we have to decouple, my, my, my message, my, the bottom line is that we have to decouple releases because a release is a previous step in order to have data. I don't know if that helps. Thank you. All right. And we have time for maybe one more question, um, maybe two. So this question is about the flight levels you were talking about. In flight levels, 
does each level define a separate OKR or do they have a common OKR? Uh, okay, just uh, there is more to be discussed here, but if you see here, okay, we are a flat level three. Okay, we have the yearly OKR here. We have the smaller OKR. And uh, here we have retracted work. Okay, so uh, how many OKRs can we uh, uh, show here? And how many pieces of work? It depends on the WIP, the work in progress. I mean, uh, you can work on several OKRs at the same time. But what you need to make sure is that at the end of the day, the things that is flowing to the short, lower levels, which is the initiatives, we don't, you don't want to really flood with too many initiatives, the teams. So it depends on how many teams do you have. And uh, the teams are going typically to work in a single initiative or perhaps combine it with some business as usual. But you cannot uh, uh, expect teams to be doing five initiatives at the same time. So my, my answer may be, it depends on how many initiatives simultaneously can handle the teams. I don't know if that helps. I mean, the, the thing is that the OKR is here. The OKR is here, only at level three, at the strategy level. What we measure on the level, what we handle, sorry, in level two and level three is work. But the OKR is at the higher level, level three, which is this one. I don't know if I answer correctly your question. Okay, if not, feel free to reach out to us for clarification. Um... So we are pretty much at our time and we're going to have to close. So thank you everyone for your questions. Like I mentioned before, we will figure out a way to get these addressed. And Alex, what is the best place for people to contact you? Uh, yeah. you? As you see here, you can contact me through scram.org or, um, sorry about that. <laughs> you know, we were testing this before we said. Uh, you can talk, contact me through scan.org, through LinkedIn, you know, whatever. I would love to really answer uh, all the questions, and I'm really uh, happy that I uh, came to this webinar and you also placed the questions. I'm really Fantastic. happy. Fantastic. Thank you. We're so happy to have you um, today. So I also want to drop a link to everyone to Alex's latest blog on this topic, um, kind of support some of the content that you saw today. And please stay connected with us through our social media channels, as well as through our forum on our website. That's a great place to go to ask questions and start discussions. And also, we do run webcasts pretty regularly. Um, every, every week or two, we have something going on. So please be sure to check out scrum.org slash webcasts to check out our schedule. And there's more constantly being added. And thank you. Yeah, thanks again, Alex, for this. I think the audience, the audience seems to have really enjoyed it and I'm glad people got value out of it today. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for coming. Right. Thank